my friend and I were looking for a place to live after finishing college. We didn't have much money, so we often checked Craigslist for cheap houses. One day, we saw an ad for a house with low rent. It seemed perfect for us, so we quickly sent a message to the owner, asking if we could visit. We gave him our phone numbers too. Later that day, the owner, now called Mr. Lee, phoned me. He said we could come to see the house the next day because he had other people coming to look at it during the week. My friend couldn't get out of work, but we didn't want to miss out. So we decided I would go alone and take photos for my friend to see later. I wasn't happy about going by myself, but we didn't have many choices. When I arrived at the house the next day, my heart sank a little. The house was away from others, at the end of a rough road. It looked like no one had taken care of it for a long time. The yard was wild with tall grass and bushes. I parked and got out, trying to see if it looked any better up close, but it didn't. I thought about leaving and pretending I never arrived. It felt a bit mean, but from the looks of it, this house wasn't right for us. Just as I was about to give up and go back to my car, a voice stopped me. A man came out from the house and said hello. I realized then it was too late to leave without being rude. Mr. Lee was really eager to show me around, so I followed him inside. The moment we entered, I felt let down. The house was old and seemed neglected. As we moved from room to room, things looked worse. The place was falling apart, clearly not like the photos on Craigslist. I asked Mr. Lee if he was planning to fix it up. He listed so many repairs that it sounded like he was promising too much. Then we went upstairs. That's when I saw a locked door at the end of the hall. I also noticed footprints in the dust on the floor. They all led to one room, but didn't seem to come back out. This made me very nervous. My heart was racing. Mr. Lee ignored other rooms and headed straight for the room with the footprints. He opened it and told me to come over, sounding more forceful this time. Feeling scared, I ran downstairs, got into my car, and drove away as fast as I could. Mr. Lee chased me until I was out of the driveway. I called the police immediately. When they arrived, the house was empty. They found that the room with the footprints had signs of recent use by at least two people. The locked room was filled with trash, like someone had been living there. The house had been empty for eight years, and it seemed these people had made it their home. I still wonder what their plan was. They didn't expect me to have a lot of money, so why set up an ambush? What did they want with me? This all happened last summer. I'm 32 years old, and I live by myself in a small apartment just outside the town. Not long ago, I moved into this new place, and ended up throwing away a lot of old things from my previous home, so I was often looking on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace for some household items. The two main things I needed were a coffee table and something to put my TV on, but I wasn't in any hurry. I figured it might take a few weeks to find the right stuff. I remember one Monday evening, after coming back from my job, I sat down to look through Craigslist. I stumbled upon a coffee table that looked pretty good. It was cheap, fairly new, and seemed to be in decent shape. I quickly sent a message to the seller and kept browsing, but in no time I received a reply. The guy, who said his name was Cole, told me he could sell it to me, but it had to be done that same night because he was moving out the next day and would otherwise throw it away. With nothing else planned for the evening, I agreed and asked him for the address. He sent it over and I checked it out on Google. The place was about 25 minutes away, in a part of town I'd never visited before. I told him I'd be there in an hour. Even though I was feeling a bit tired and it was already late, the thought of finally getting a coffee table made me set aside my hesitations. Plus, I had already finished my dinner and was ready to go. So I got into my car and started driving towards the address. The weather was slightly rainy, making me hope the table wasn't too big or heavy, so that we could quickly load it into my car without it getting wet. The journey there felt longer than expected, with lots of twists and turns, leading me to a small and dark neighborhood. By dark, I mean it was really lacking in streetlights, and the ones that were there didn't do much. Also, nearly all the houses were dark. It was late, so I wasn't expecting a bustling neighborhood, but the emptiness added an eerie vibe. When I reached the house, it was a small single-floor building, one of the few with lights still on. Turning into the driveway, I noticed a man in the garage, looking like he was searching for something. As soon as I parked, he glanced my way, then hurried inside. 
I stayed in the car for a bit, expecting him to return, but he didn't. Feeling a bit uneasy, I stepped out and walked towards the garage, knocking on the door. After knocking a second time with no response, I started wondering whether I should head to the front door instead. The whole situation was beginning to feel wrong, and I thought about leaving when, suddenly, the door opened. It was a different guy from the one I saw earlier, but he introduced himself as Cole. Cole invited me inside to see the coffee table. I followed him to the living room where the table was just like in the photos, not damaged and exactly what I was looking for. While I was checking it out, Cole started talking about his new place. Every time I tried to say I'd take the table, he would just talk over me. It became really uncomfortable. He kept distracting me with his stories for what felt like forever. It seemed like he was trying to keep me there on purpose. I finally had enough, interrupted him, and said I had to leave soon. Suddenly, he said I could have the table for free. That made me feel weird, but I asked if he could help me carry it to my car. We lifted the table together. It needed both of us to move it. We were about to load it into my car in the garage when I heard footsteps rushing towards me. A person wearing a mask and hoodie appeared from the side of the house, running straight at me. I was scared and didn't know what to do. This person wasn't acting super threatening, but it was weird because Cole just stood there doing nothing. The masked man demanded my wallet and phone, showing me a knife. I raised my hands, not really feeling scared enough to give him anything. He asked again, this time louder, but I decided to run towards my car. As I ran, he tried to grab me but missed. I got into my car, locked it, and drove off quickly. I didn't realize until I was away that I had a cut on my arm. The man must have managed to slice me as I ran. I stopped a bit down the road and called the police, giving them all the details about Cole and his masked friend. Turns out, Cole really was his name. The police talked to him and found out that the whole thing was a setup to rob me, with the masked guy being his friend. They were both young, and this was their first time trying a robbery which probably explained why everything felt off. Luckily, the cut on my arm was shallow and didn't need any serious medical attention. They faced some charges, but nothing major. I think they were too scared to try anything like this again. This experience made me more cautious. I'm just thankful I decided to run because it stopped them from maybe doing this to someone else. I rarely use Craigslist when I want to buy something because usually things are too expensive. But sometimes, you can find stuff there for a really good price. At this time, I was looking for gym equipment. New gym stuff costs a lot, so Craigslist seemed like the best option to find something more affordable. For a couple of days, I kept looking through the website until I found an ad that caught my eye. It was for a set of weights, and the price was really good. The ad was fresh, posted just a few hours before. The person who put up the ad was named Anna, so I sent her a message saying I was interested in the weights and wanted to pick them up as soon as I could. Anna wrote back quickly, telling me she would be home from work and ready to meet at 7 in the evening. It was a bit late, but I didn't mind because I really wanted the weights. I said yes, and she sent me her home address. I looked it up online to see where it was and what her house looked like. Her place was about 20 minutes away in a small area that I knew because a friend of mine lived there before. The house was medium-sized and looked pretty old, but nothing out of the ordinary. It didn't make me feel uneasy. So, that night I drove over. Her house was the last one on a dead-end street. I parked my car near their mailbox and walked up to their front door, which was partly open. I didn't think it was right to just walk in, so I knocked on the doorframe a few times. After a short wait, a man appeared from the back of the house. I told him, Hi. I'm here to see Anna about some gym equipment she advertised on Craigslist. The man smiled warmly and invited me inside, explaining Anna would be down shortly as she was changing from her work outfit. I felt a bit wary, but the man seemed honest enough, so I followed him into the living room. There, right on the floor, was the set of weights Anna had advertised. But looking around, I noticed there was nothing else in the room. No chairs, no pictures on the walls, nothing. It seemed empty, like nobody really lived here. The man must have seen me looking around because he quickly said they were moving out soon, and that's why they were selling the weights. But something felt off. I saw in the ad there were more weights than this. I asked him if this was all they had because the pictures showed more. 
He smiled again, saying Anna should know where the rest were. But then he just stood there, staring at me. Feeling more uncomfortable, I asked him if he could check with Anna. He paused, then nodded and walked upstairs. I wasn't sure Anna even existed at this point, so I listened carefully for any sign of conversation, but it was silent. After a moment, I quietly moved to the stairs and saw him at the top, just staring at the wall, not talking to anyone. Panic set in. I realized something was very wrong. I hurried towards the door, trying to be quiet. But then I heard him coming down the stairs fast. He shouted for me to wait, but I didn't stop. I ran out, got into my car, and drove away. As I left, I saw him run to the side of the house instead of following me. I stopped once I was far enough away and called the police. I didn't know what he was planning, but it was clearly something bad. The police visited me later to take my statement. They told me the house had been empty for a year, which sent a chill down my spine. I couldn't offer much, just what the man looked like and the possibility of fingerprints on the weights. It's scary to think he might still be out there, trying to trick others. But I'm just relieved I got out when I did, before finding out what he really wanted. I shared a small house with a buddy, who I'll call Joe, while we were in college. He was my roommate during our first year, and afterwards, we decided to leave the dorm life behind and rent a house together since we both worked and could afford it. This was a new experience for us, renting a place on our own, and we were pretty clueless about managing our expenses. At first, things seemed fine, but after nearly a year, we noticed our savings dwindling rapidly. Faced with the choice of moving out or finding someone else to share the costs, we preferred to stay and began looking for another roommate. We asked around among our friends first, but no luck. So we had no choice but to look online. I posted an ad on Facebook Marketplace, and Joe used Craigslist. It was a bit odd for us, trying to find a roommate this way, but we didn't see any other option. A few weeks passed with only a couple of people showing interest, but not committing until Joe received an email from a guy named Alex who saw his Craigslist ad. Alex seemed all right, and he came by the next day to check out the place. He was a bit older than us, had finished college, but seemed friendly and tidy, so we were happy to let him move in. For the first few months, Alex would spend time with us and everything was good. But then, he suddenly started keeping to himself. He stayed locked up in his room all the time, hardly ever speaking to us or leaving his room except for food or work. It was weird, but not really a problem, just odd. However, about four months after Alex moved in, things began to get really strange. I came back from work one day, and as soon as I entered, Joe whispered to me from the living room. He said, something's up. He explained in a hushed voice that Alex was in the house, so we should keep it down. Then he told me about a foul smell he noticed near Alex's room. I hadn't smelled anything myself. Joe pointed down the hallway towards Alex's room, suggesting I sneak past and take a whiff myself. So off I went, tiptoeing closer, and that's when the stench hit me. It was unlike anything I've ever smelled before, a mix of something rotten and strangely chemical. We decided to confront Alex about it. We approached his door, holding our breath as much as possible, and knocked several times. Alex, you there? No answer came. Joe was sure Alex was inside. But after waiting with no response, we decided to leave it until the next day. Night came, and we tried to ignore the day's weirdness with a quick dinner and some TV before heading off to bed. The next morning, I caught Alex as he was leaving. Hey, what was that smell yesterday? He barely looked at me, muttering something about taking out the trash, then hurried off. His answer didn't sit right with me, but I let it go for the moment. I shared this with Joe, and while we both found it odd, we didn't push further. Weeks passed, and the smell disappeared. Alex remained distant, barely interacting with us. One night, coming home late, the house was quiet, everyone likely asleep. I went to bed but was awoken by sounds from downstairs, from Alex's area. Curiosity peaked, but sleep took over, and I drifted off again. Days went by and Alex didn't return home. Calls to his phone went straight to voicemail. Concerned, Joe and I decided to check his room for any clues. It looked as if he had packed some belongings in a hurry, 
Among the mess I found a pair of glasses, which was odd since I never saw Alex wear any. His sudden disappearance, leaving most of his things behind, prompted us to call the police. An officer came, took our statements, and started an investigation. A week later, a detective informed us the man we knew as Alex was actually someone else, identified by a family as their missing son, gone for almost a year. The revelation added layers of mystery and fear to our experience. The man had fabricated his entire identity, living with us while his family searched for him. The case grew complex, and eventually, updates ceased. The realization that we shared our home with someone hiding under a false identity, possibly evading law enforcement or darker elements, was unsettling. The mystery of his true intentions and whereabouts lingers, a chilling reminder of our brush with the unknown. Six years back, I was getting ready to move to a new house far away and was trying to clear out stuff that took too much space. The only way I thought to get rid of things fast and make a little money was through Craigslist. I put up about 10 ads for various items, pricing each under $20 to sell them quickly. By the end of the week, almost everything was gone except for a few items, including a workout bench and some weights. I really didn't want to take this with me, so I was eager to sell it. Just a few days before I was set to leave, someone finally emailed me about it. The email was short, just saying, I can pick it up today. That's it. I wrote back asking when they could come. For the next hour, we sent messages back and forth. Their replies were brief and unclear, which I thought was strange. Usually, I wouldn't share my address after such a weird talk, but since I was moving soon, I figured it didn't matter much. I waited for the person in my kitchen, checking my phone. After about 30 minutes of silence, I heard a car outside and footsteps coming to my door. I expected a ring or a knock but got nothing. So I decided to open the door myself. The man seemed surprised to see me open the door but didn't do anything. He just stood there, hands in his pockets, staring ahead as if lost in thought. You're here for the workout gear? I asked, trying to make sense of his odd behavior. He nodded quietly and I led him to the room where the bench and weights were. I expected him to start checking them out, but he didn't. He just stood there, looking at them without really seeing them. From our emails, I guessed he was a quiet person, maybe a bit shy, but standing there, I felt something wasn't right with him. We were both silent, him not moving or speaking, and me waiting for him to do something about the bench. Then. Someone knocked on the front door. The man quickly turned his head towards the sound, his eyes wide as if he was scared or something. He seemed to watch me, seeing how I would react. I had a bad feeling, but I pretended everything was fine. I walked towards the door with the man following me closely. Just before I reached the hallway, he grabbed my arm. I jerked away, asking him what was wrong, but he just stared at me, his face showing nothing. Another knock came louder this time. Suddenly the man rushed past me, opened the front door, and that was my chance. I ran out the back door. Looking back, I saw three more men walking into my house. They didn't come after me, and I managed to hide in my neighbor's yard and call the police. While hiding, I saw shadows moving inside my house through the windows. It was scary, thinking about what could have happened if I hadn't escaped. The police arrived after five long minutes of waiting. They didn't find much inside, just what I had told them about the man and his strange behavior. The intruders hadn't taken much. My house was almost empty because of the move. What they would have done if I hadn't run, I can't say for sure. But I don't think I would have been safe. After that day, I never used Craigslist again. I tell everyone to stay away from it too. Last year, I decided to sell some of my old sneakers online to make a bit of extra money. I was planning to leave my small flat soon and needed cash for the moving company. The sneakers were quite ordinary, but I put them up for sale at good prices, hoping they'd sell fast. But it turned out that selling shoes on Craigslist might not have been the best idea, as it took a whole week before anyone showed interest. The first person to respond was someone with the name Mike Brown in his email. He offered $5 less than my asking price. It was a small difference, but I was eager to sell, so I accepted. 
We agreed to meet the next day at 5 p.m. in a busy gas station parking lot in the city center. On the day of the meeting, I texted him. He replied he was on his way, and I headed out to the gas station, arriving right at 5. Mike hadn't arrived yet, but with the traffic being heavy, I expected him to be a bit late. I waited in my car, and after about 30 minutes, the traffic thinned, the sun began to set, and then Mike finally arrived. He drove an old, beat-up car that looked like it should be in a junkyard, with all its lights out. He parked beside me and stepped out. Mike was a big man, probably in his thirties, wearing tattered clothes and with long, messy hair. He didn't talk much. I showed him the sneakers, and he examined them silently, repeatedly glancing back at the gas station. I couldn't figure out what caught his attention there. Aside from a man fueling up his car, the place was deserted. Mike took his time, inspecting the sneakers over and over, as if they were something precious, though they were just regular shoes. Then, as the other car drove off, Mike suddenly changed. He stopped looking at the shoes and stared at me instead. What else have you got? he asked, his tone making me uneasy. I was confused. These are the only sneakers I have with me. Didn't you want just these? His expression turned cold. He moved past me and grabbed my car door, trying to open it. It was locked. Mike looked at me and demanded I unlock it, his voice now a clear threat. I froze for a moment, unsure of what to do. Reluctantly, I unlocked the door, thinking he might just grab some small change I had inside. But then, he said something totally unexpected. Get in, he demanded, opening the car's passenger door and insisting once more. I was shocked, my fear escalating rapidly. I glanced around, hoping for any sign of others nearby. But the gas station was desolate. No one was around. No people. No cars. Mike grabbed my arm, pulling me toward the door. He snatched the keys from my hand and pushed me into the car, hitting me in the face a few times in the process. I tried to stand, but Mike slammed the door on my head, blurring my vision and causing everything around me to fade in and out. I could hear him moving around the car, seemingly heading to the driver's side. But then, abruptly, he turned and ran back to his own vehicle. My mind was foggy, and I barely remember what happened next, but it seems like someone arrived just in time confronting Mike and driving him off. If this person hadn't shown up and Mike had managed to take me in my car, the outcome could have been dire. Given his car appeared stolen or was not registered under his name, taking my car and me without leaving any evidence of our encounter would have allowed him ample time to do as he pleased before anyone would even start looking for me. I know some people might not agree with this, but I used to use Craigslist a lot. I always made sure to meet people in public places and talk to them on the phone first before meeting up in person. For me, Craigslist was the easiest way to sell stuff I didn't need anymore or to buy things without spending too much money. For years, I never had any problems. I met lots of different people and bought or sold so many things I lost count. But then, everything changed. One day, I was looking for a bike and found a cheap one that seemed okay. It wasn't the best looking, but it was just a normal bike that worked, which was all I needed. I sent a message to the seller saying I was interested, and they got back to me in an hour, telling me it was still for sale at the price they had listed. We talked on the phone quickly about where and when we could meet, and decided on a gas station halfway between where we both lived. We agreed to meet at 6.30 p.m. On that day, I drove to the gas station and arrived 15 minutes early. He had told me to look out for a blue Chevy truck, so I kept my eyes open for it. 30 minutes passed and he still hadn't arrived. The sun was starting to go down, and I didn't want to be out there in the dark, so I sent him a message asking if he was close by. He called me back a minute later. Sorry, I'm on my way now. I'll be there soon. Then he hung up quickly, before I could say anything. His voice was rushed which made it hard for me to decide if I should be worried about how strange the call was, or if he was just trying to hurry because he was late. I stayed in my car, waiting another fifteen minutes for him to finally arrive. The truck the man arrived in was old and looked like it hadn't been taken care of at all, which didn't make me feel great about the deal. I stepped out to meet him. He was of average height, dressed in loose clothes, and appeared to be in his twenties or thirties. To put it simply, he looked unkempt. His hair was messy, and his clothes seemed like they had not seen water in ages. 
He went to the back of his truck, opened it, and took out the bike. To my surprise, the bike looked perfect. It wasn't anything special at first glance, but it was clear that it had been well maintained, which was more than I could say for the man selling it. I checked the bike over and even rode it for a short while. Everything seemed fine, but then I started to think more about the situation, and my excitement faded. It was almost certain this bike was stolen. After seeing the man in his truck, it just didn't add up that this bike belonged to him. Considering the bike's age, it was odd that it didn't have a single mark or bit of dirt on it. Once I had this thought, I couldn't shake it. I knew I couldn't buy the bike without being sure it wasn't stolen. I tried to ask him about it without being too obvious. How long have you had it? I asked. A few years, he said, but that didn't tell me much. So I asked why he was selling it, which seemed like a normal question, but his reply was alarming. What does it matter? It works, right? He said, looking at me impatiently and rudely. It was ironic that he was the one being impatient after I had waited for him. I decided I didn't want the bike anymore and told him I was leaving. As I tried to open my car door, he quickly pushed it closed. No, you're buying it. I didn't come here for nothing, he insisted. I could sense the danger, but I thought I was safe since we were at a gas station with people nearby. I told him I was concerned about the bike's origin and wouldn't buy it if it wasn't rightfully his. He hesitated for a moment, then pushed me against my car and demanded the money. After he hit me, I had no choice but to give him all the money I had. He hurried back to his truck and sped away, nearly hitting another car as he left the gas station. I looked around and saw a few people who had witnessed everything. Not one of them offered to help or even agreed to stay and be a witness. The police never caught him, so I lost my money. Beyond the financial loss, it was disheartening to see that no one around me cared enough to intervene. They were all content to watch, but did nothing to help. This experience made me question humanity's willingness to help others in trouble. I had just finished my studies and needed a small place to live while I looked for a job. I was working part-time at a little grocery store, but now that I was done with school, it was time to find something better. Renting an apartment by myself was too expensive, so I was on the lookout for a room to rent in someone's house. I knew it would be a bit uncomfortable at first, living with strangers, but I didn't really have another option. My friend from school, who used to share a room with me, told me to try Craigslist. It seemed that other websites didn't list single rooms or were too complicated to use. Craigslist had a lot of choices, so I decided to stick with it. But after several days, I was getting nowhere. Nobody answered my messages, and the few who did just said the room was already taken. Then, on a Saturday morning, I saw a new listing. It was close, affordable, and looked decent. A man named John was offering a large house with an available bedroom, which also had its own bathroom and closet. It seemed perfect, so I sent him an email to show my interest and then went off to my job. Since the ad was fresh that morning, I was hopeful I was the first to reach out. During my lunch break, I checked my emails and saw that John had replied. He wanted me to come and see the place that same afternoon. I knew I'd be tired after work, but I really wanted this room, so I agreed and we set a time. After my shift, I drove there, taking only about 10 minutes. The house looked good from the outside, just a normal house in a regular neighborhood. I parked my car nearby and walked up to the door to knock softly. After waiting a little, I knocked again, a bit louder. Just as I was about to text John, he opened the door to let me in. He was covered in sweat, as though he'd just been exercising, and he didn't smell nice at all. I didn't want to seem rude so I didn't mention it. He started showing me around the first floor, pointing out the kitchen and living room. He said he hardly used these rooms, so I wouldn't be in his way. But looking around, it seemed like he used them a lot. The kitchen sink was overflowing with dirty dishes, and the couch was stained all over. The house was a lot messier than I expected, especially since the photos made it look so clean. One thing that really stood out to me was the couch in the living room. The picture showed a brown leather couch, but the one I saw was black. I guess John might have used old photos of the house from before. This felt a bit dishonest, but I was mainly interested in my room, which was upstairs. John led me to the stairs and then stopped, gesturing for me to go up first. 
I felt really uneasy as I climbed the stairs, especially since John stayed at the bottom, just smiling and telling me my room was the first one on the left. When I reached the top and was about to go to my room, I heard a soft noise from behind the door. I looked back at John, and his smile was gone. Is there someone else living here? I asked. He sounded annoyed and said it was just a friend staying over, and I shouldn't worry. He told me to go look at the room, insisting I would like it. By then, I was scared. Why didn't he mention his friend earlier? It felt like something I should have known. I wanted to leave immediately. I tried to sound confident as I told John the place wasn't right for me and started back down the stairs. He didn't seem happy and blocked the bottom of the stairs. I stopped a few steps away, insisting I had to leave. He tried once more to get me to see the room, but I refused. After a moment, he surprisingly stepped aside with a smile, letting me pass. I rushed out the door. Something was off about that house. I felt fortunate to get out so easily. I'd feared I might need to push my way out. Later I checked Craigslist, and the ad was gone. I often think about what was in that room. Maybe it was empty, but I feel it was something far worse. A few months ago, I decided to sell an old laptop on Craigslist. It was still in good condition, but I had to get a new one for my job, and I didn't see the point of keeping the old one. I set the price at $80, thinking it was a fair deal. Days went by without any interest, and I almost forgot I had posted it. But then, a week later, I saw an email from someone interested in it. They just wanted to know if it was still up for grabs. I replied, and they got back to me the same day. They said they could come over the next day at 5 p.m. to see the laptop. That evening, I realized I didn't even know the person's name. Their email didn't give anything away. It looked like some random username rather than a real name. I didn't worry too much about it, thinking they probably didn't notice which email they were using. The next day, a few hours before our meeting, I sent them my home address. It was my day off, so I was home the whole day. By 4.30 p.m., I hadn't heard back from them but I didn't think it was a big deal. I opened my living room blinds to watch for their arrival and sat down to watch some TV. An hour passed as I flipped between shows and peeked outside, but nobody came. I assumed they had changed their mind and didn't bother to let me know. It didn't really bother me. I just kept watching TV, trying to enjoy my evening. Around 8 p.m., I started falling asleep on the couch when a noise from my back door jolted me awake. Fully awake now, I checked the door but saw nothing. I turned on the outside light for a better look, but my backyard was empty. I thought I might have heard someone trying to open the door, but I was half asleep, so I wasn't sure. I went around making sure everything was locked and looked outside the windows for any signs of movement. That's when I heard a knock on my front door. I quietly moved to see who it was through the door's peephole. There was a man, maybe around his late thirties, standing outside on my porch. He was walking back and forth, mumbling something to himself. Then he stopped, came closer to the door, and knocked again. Who's there? I asked, not opening the door and still watching him through the peephole. He looked straight at the door and said he wanted to speak to the person who lived here. His speech was not clear. He was either on drugs or not thinking straight. I decided not to say anything back. When he realized I wasn't going to answer, he said again, more loudly this time, that he really needed to talk. He started pacing back and forth again which made me feel very uneasy. With one hand still on the door, I took my phone out with the other and called the police. While I was talking to them, he knocked one more time and then ran towards the garage. I quickly grabbed my new laptop to check the live video from my security camera above the garage. I saw his car parked very close to my garage door and the man was trying to open the garage with a crowbar. He looked crazy and I was really scared. He tried a few times but couldn't open it. Then he got back into his car, seemed to be looking for something in the glove compartment, came out, hit my garage door with the crowbar in frustration, and then drove off. Even though I showed the police the video of him and his car, they still haven't found him. I'm not sure if this had anything to do with me selling the laptop on Craigslist, but it feels connected. I can't stop thinking about what could have happened if he had managed to get in. Around the same time last year, 
I made a decision to clean out some stuff from my place using Craigslist. My home was too crowded, and I was looking to buy new furniture soon. With the cold season coming, I was eager to clear out the old items quickly. The main thing I wanted to sell was a pair of big old-fashioned chairs in my sitting area. They were pretty large and not the latest style, but they were still in good shape, no tears or stains. Within just half a day, I got a few messages about them, but two were offering too little money. Only one person seemed truly interested in buying them. He asked to see the chairs after his work, around 6 or 6.30 p.m. I was okay with that, just wanting to sell them as soon as possible. Usually I'd prefer to meet buyers in a public place, but I had no way to move the chairs, and they were too heavy for me to lift on my own. So, I gave him my home address. When 6 p.m. came, I turned on the light outside the front door and pulled back the curtains, then waited in the sitting room, browsing on my phone. After about 20 minutes, a truck drove up to my house. They sat in the truck for a bit before finally coming to the door. I greeted him and let him inside. He looked like a regular guy, maybe in his late 20s or early 30s, dressed in usual work clothes. His name was Matt, and he started talking lightly, sharing his excitement over the chairs and some other small things. He seemed friendly, and I began to feel at ease, thinking this sale would be done without any trouble. He checked out the chair, even sat on it, and looked satisfied. We agreed on the price easily, and just as we were about to trade the money, a loud noise of a car door closing came from outside. It sounded close, as if it happened in my driveway where Matt had parked his truck. Matt hurried outside to see what was happening, and I stayed inside, confused and curious. Peering out the window, I noticed there weren't any other cars around. It seemed like someone was tampering with his truck. When Matt came back inside, he was visibly upset, telling me someone had taken things from his truck. He seemed to doubt me thinking maybe I was involved. Of course I wasn't, and I told him so, but it made sense for us both to be cautious of each other. I wasn't sure if this was some sort of trick, but before we could figure anything out, we heard quick footsteps coming to the front door. Turning, we saw a young guy with a hood barging in. His eyes were wild, and he looked totally out of control. He had one hand in his pocket, clearly holding something dangerous. Just a few feet away, he stood there, his anger evident. Though he was just a kid, maybe 18 or 19, the danger was clear. Matt and I didn't move, hoping not to trigger him. Then Matt tried to calm him down, slowly moving closer with his hands raised. But the kid quickly pulled out a gun and pointed it at Matt. It might have been a fake gun, but we couldn't be sure, and the kid's behavior suggested it was real. He shouted at Matt to leave the house. In shock, Matt followed his command. The kid pushed Matt out, made him get into the truck and climbed in after him. I was frozen with fear as they drove off, forced by the kid. Right after they left, I called the police and tried to follow them in my car, telling the dispatcher everything, but they disappeared. The police started looking into it, finding Matt's details and his truck's plate number quickly. Days passed, and I waited for any news, but nothing came. Matt and his truck are still missing. I feel a heavy guilt, thinking maybe I could have done something more. But everything happened so fast, and it was too risky. I couldn't even be sure if Matt was part of some complicated plan. The motives of that kid, why all of this happened, remain a mystery. A year has almost gone by, and it seems unlikely we'll ever get the full story. I often browse sites like Craigslist because, like many people, I search for things at lower prices. When you don't have much money, Finding deals on these websites is crucial for buying stuff like furniture, which is usually very pricey in stores. This event took place when I was hunting for a new dining table. Our old one was really showing its age, having served as both a dining spot and a work area for my family for many years. I checked out Facebook Marketplace and OfferUp first, but I didn't find anything worthwhile. Most items were still too costly, and the sellers wouldn't lower their prices even when I tried to negotiate, so I turned to Craigslist. It seems like most people around here prefer other platforms these days, but Craigslist sometimes has the best bargains, although they're not always easy to find. Right when I opened the site and searched, I spotted an excellent deal. The ad was for a simple wooden dining table in decent condition, listed for only $100.
that was a bargain compared to the $500 prices I saw elsewhere. I messaged the seller to express my interest and said I was willing to pay the asking price. He didn't respond immediately, so I spent some time with my kids until they went to their rooms for the night. When I checked my laptop again, there was a reply from a few minutes earlier. The seller's message was brief, apologizing because he planned to throw the table away the next morning. But if I really wanted it, I needed to come over that night, or before 5 a.m. the following day. I found it odd that he was okay with a nighttime sale, and his explanation seemed strange, but after thinking it over, I agreed to come immediately. It was only 7 p.m., and I preferred not to go too late at night or too early in the morning. The seller quickly agreed and sent me his address. It was a short drive from my home, so I informed my wife about my plans and the location, then left. Given my neighborhood, you might guess it's not the fanciest. So when I say the seller's house looked really run down, I mean it was in worse shape than most around here. It was a small house, similar to others in the area, but its yard was cluttered with garbage and various items, all enclosed by a flimsy chain-link fence. I parked nearby and walked through the fence gate, making my way through the cluttered yard to the house. The front door was already open, inviting yet somehow ominous. I could hear voices and laughter as I got closer. I peeked through the open door and knocked softly. Immediately, a young man, looking to be in his mid-twenties, like a college student, greeted me and waved me in. Entering the house, the mess was the first thing I noticed. Empty beer cans everywhere and the carpet was full of stains. It seemed like the place had seen countless parties and wasn't cared for properly. The man seemed chill, walking me through the hallway to the kitchen, explaining that he no longer had space for the table. In the kitchen, two other guys, around the same age, leaned against the wall, chatting. Then I saw the table. Surprisingly, it looked barely used, which didn't make sense given the state of the house. As I examined the table for any damages or signs of wear, everything suddenly became silent. The two men stopped talking, and the seller was quiet too. I looked up. All three were staring at me. Is something wrong? I asked, scanning their faces. One of them, right next to me, had huge pupils, like he was on something strong, but I couldn't tell what. At that moment, I felt something was off. I didn't want anything from this house, especially not from these people. I've changed my mind. Thanks anyway, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I tried to head back to the hallway, but one of them blocked my path, silently standing there. Their expressions and actions made it clear this was all planned, and they probably never intended to sell the table. Fear took over me as I stood there, unsure of what would happen next. Suddenly, one of them whispered to the blocker, and they parted, allowing me to leave. I walked past them quickly, out of the house, and back to my car. Driving home, I couldn't stop thinking about what they might have planned, and why they let me go in the end. After reaching home, I shared everything with my wife, who insisted on contacting the police. However, they said they couldn't act on it since nothing actually happened. So... The real intentions of those men remain a mystery. I just hope nobody else finds out the hard way. I was searching on Craigslist to buy some chairs and a table for my new house's outside space. I had moved into a place with a space outside for sitting, and I was happy about spending time there, but did not want to spend too much money. On the site, lots of people were selling things for the outside but most were old or looked very used. I kept looking for a week until I found a post selling a set that I liked. It was just two chairs and a table, but they looked good and the price was okay. I sent a message and waited. The seller, now called Tom, replied quickly. He said the set was almost new but got some small damages during delivery. After some messages, we decided to meet the next day at six in the evening at his place. The next day, feeling a bit nervous but excited, I drove to the address Tom had given me. The house was at the end of a very quiet street, surrounded by tall, dark trees that made it seem even more isolated. The moment I got out of my car, a cold breeze made me shiver. Not just from the cold, but from the sudden feeling that something was off. As I walked up to the front door, I noticed the garden was overgrown, and the house looked like no one had lived there for a while. I knocked on the door and waited. Silence. I knocked again harder this time. 
Finally the door slowly opened, and there stood Tom, a tall man with a strange look in his eyes. He greeted me with a voice that was too cheerful, which didn't match the uneasiness I felt. He led me to the backyard where the furniture was. The chairs and table looked exactly like in the photos, but now, seeing them up close, I noticed the scratches seemed more like marks made intentionally, almost like symbols. Tom started talking about the furniture, but I couldn't focus on his words. I felt a heavy air around us, as if we were not alone. The garden was too silent, no sound of birds or even wind, just our voices. Tom's eyes kept darting around, making me feel more anxious. I tried to listen to what he was saying, trying to ignore the feeling of dread that was growing inside me. But it was hard. My gaze kept being drawn to the shadows between the trees, half expecting to see something or someone staring back at us. Suddenly, Tom stopped talking. He looked behind me, his face going pale. And that's when I heard it. A faint whisper, coming from nowhere and everywhere at once. I turned around quickly, but there was nothing there. Just the empty, silent garden. The story of buying outdoor furniture was turning into something much more sinister, and I realized that this meeting might have been a mistake. But now, standing in Tom's garden, it was too late to turn back. The whispers seemed to grow louder, and I felt a chill run down my spine, knowing that something was very wrong here. The next day, I drove to the place Tom had told me about. When I arrived, I noticed that the house was dark except for a light at the front door. The house looked big and fancy. I parked my car and walked to the door to ring the bell. After ringing, nothing happened. No one came to the door and no lights turned on. I peeked through a small window, trying to see if anyone was there, but I couldn't see anyone inside. Suddenly my phone buzzed with a message from Tom telling me to go to the backyard through a gate. I felt something was strange, but since it was just for chairs and a table, I decided to go along. I walked to the gate, pushed it open, and went into the backyard. Tom appeared and showed me the furniture, which looked really nice, almost too nice to be true. I checked the furniture for any damage but couldn't find any. Then, Tom started to hurry me, asking if I wanted to buy it right away. His change in behavior made me notice that the setup looked too perfect, like it wasn't really meant to be sold. When I hesitated, Tom became pushy, trying to make me buy it quickly. Feeling unsafe, I said I needed more time to think and started to leave, but Tom followed me, looking more threatening with each step. I ran to my car as fast as I could, hearing Tom chasing me until I got away. From my car I saw Tom run to another street, get into a car and drive off. I called the police and found out the house wasn't his, and the owners were away. The man was trying to sell their things without them knowing. Luckily, he hadn't broken into the house, but it was still scary to think about what could have happened if I stayed any longer. I'm just glad I left when I did, or I might not have been able to escape.